Good morning. Would you guys stand with us as we start to our worship this morning? Let's uh, start off and go to the Lord in prayer really quick before we get started. God, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the ability to gather here, and we pray that you would bless the service, help the sounds that we make with our voices to be pleasing to your ears, that we might praise you with our hearts and not just our mouths and our Thank you for all of your blessings, Lord. Amen. scripture this morning to help us to think about uh, what God wants out of our hearts this morning. And so we're in Philippians chapter 4, and starting in verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So today we get to, to praise God because he is with us no matter what we're facing. So lay your anxiety at the cross, lay your worry at the cross, and let's spend some time rejoicing.
Good morning. You may be seated for just a moment. Uh, since today we are having the Lord's Supper and that observance, we're going to make announcements earlier in the service today and, um, and give you some updates on some things. Um, first of all, before we get started, um, I want to recognize a couple of young ladies. And uh, I don't know, yesterday was the Cotton Carnival. And uh, so we have two of the young ladies. We, I was looking for one of them in particular, our first runner-up, but I don't see her anywhere. So, But anyway, uh, little Miss Cotton Carnival is Libby Hammontree. Would you stand up, Libby? <laughs> All right. And uh, Miss Cotton Carnival is Maggie Drury. So would you stand up? See, who says we don't have pretty girls here? All right. <laughs> evening worship this evening is at 6 o'clock, and I want to remind you of that. New members class, we also have our youth drama team will be meeting at 6. The new members class today, if you're interested in being a part of that, will be in room 420. Uh, if you have joined our church or been baptized and, and you want to become a member, you need to be going to that class. Uh, Deacons are meeting today at four, uh, in room 420 right after life groups. Uh, Wednesday, we'll be, we will continue with Awana. Uh, we have youth and adult Bible studies. Um, our youth are studying uh, the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Our adults are, stu are studying uh, a book called, Is This the End? And I would encourage you to, to come and to see, the, uh, to be a part of that and to hear and to listen. Uh, we would, after church today, we have life groups. If you don't know where to go for a life group, we have folks that are right out here. Uh, in the lobby that can give you direction and guidance to that. And so um, I would encourage you to, to uh, find a place and join a group and uh, be a part of a small group that studies God's Word each week. We do need greeters, and we need folks uh, to work at that counter out there. So if you could do that, please sign up. Also want to remind you, and you might could put a word in about this, uh, the family camping trip is the, uh, on Friday, October the 8th. That's this coming Friday. And... Uh, and uh, it'll be till Saturday morning at, or Saturday afternoon at 1 p.m. It'll be finished. Uh, currently, we don't have enough folks to actually make it to cover the cost. And so if you are planning on going, please sign up today. And um, this afternoon, there will be a visitation from 3 to 4 uh, for Tommy Eaton at uh, the Loy uh, with a funeral at 4 o'clock at McMichael Funeral Home today. So if you wanted to, McMichael. I'm still learning. I pronounced it like we did in Louisiana. Okay. McMichael in Sexton. Okay. Did you have anything else you wanted to tell them about the? Just sign up today so we can figure out if we've got enough people and get our numbers in. And we, we're excited to, I've got craft ideas I'm really excited about for the kids. So uh, come and make it a good event. And I think that's all the announcements today. So if you would stand and we're going to continue with our worship music. Jesus. 
God, we thank you so much for bringing us here today, and we pray over the rest of the service, Lord, that your name would be glorified, that Pastor Mitch would speak to our hearts, um, and that we would go home and we would live differently and live like you would want us to live. And so we just praise and thank you in your name. Amen. May be seated. If you didn't hear me, they didn't announce it, but on, it didn't go on the screen today, but I think it's time for Praise Palace. I guess they're having it, so. Anyway, um, if you're arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? I saw pictures this week of pastors in Canada, read a story about one, being arrested for having services. I mean, literally arrested for having services and put in jail. I saw pictures this week that happened a while back of people in Minnesota having church outside, social distancing with masks on and being carried off by the police in handcuffs for having church. If you think persecution is not coming, it's coming. We're fortunate that we live in a state where we have a Christian governor and he didn't put those kind of mandates on us and we had the choice what to do. 
But I'm telling you, the liberal left is using COVID as an excuse to attack churches. It's happening all over the nation. So when we see those things, there ought to be thousands of Christians standing up and saying enough is enough. That's what ought to happen. But it's coming, and if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And that's what the series is. We're on the fourth week of this series. Uh, we, we've been looking at the marks of a true believer. We started with the most obvious mark of a true believer, being born again. And now for the last three weeks, we've been looking at prayer. Uh, a true believer prays. A, a true believer is a person who believes in prayer. A true believer is a person who practices prayer. And we've divided prayer into three parts using the Lord's Supper or the Lord's Prayer as our example. And the first part we talked about was repentance and confession. Well, I'm sorry. The first part we talked about was praise and worship in your private prayer time. The second part was repentance and confession. And today we're going to be talking about believing faith. I read a statement this week that made a lot of sense to me. You may or may not agree with it, but I, I think it's wholeheartedly right. When a brother or sister in Christ says to you, I'm praying for you, or a brother and sister in Christ says to you, I'm going to pray for you, and they really mean it, that's another way of that brother or sister in Christ saying, I love you. Think about that. That's Christian speak for I love you. I love you, and I'm going to pray for you. You're my brother, and you're my sister. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And, of course, we've been looking at the Lord's Prayer. I sang it the first week. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed by, be thy name. We're going to be looking at this next part. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And so today we're going to focus in, first of all, in the verses, give us this day our daily bread. And as we focus in on those verses, we're going to be talking about believing faith, approaching God with confidence, approaching God with the confidence that he loves you, approaching him with confidence and making requests for ourselves and for others. And we're going to be, first of all, in Ephesians chapter 3, if you want to turn there, the first verse is about to come up on the screen. Ephesians 3, 12, in the NIV it says this, in him, meaning Jesus, in him and through faith in him, again meaning Jesus, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. In Jesus, he is our mediator, in Jesus we can approach God in prayer with freedom and with confidence. Have you ever thought about that? To many people, prayer is a mystery. But to the true believer, there should be no mystery. I got a box up here. It's got question marks on it. And, uh, you know, you've, you, have you ever watched Let's Make a Deal? I'll take the box. If a stranger handed you the box, would you have the confidence to open it? I heard something rattle a while ago. It could be a snake. It could be a box of spiders. How many of you love spiders? I knew we had at least one weird one here. <laughs> it could be $1,000. But you don't know what's in here. So there's the mystery of the box. Now, if a stranger handed me a box like this, it could be filled with white powder, go up your nose and kill you. So... Would you have the confidence to open the box if a stranger gave it to you not knowing what was in it? Most of you probably take a chance because you'd rather have money than anything else. You'd fight the spiders for the money, right? The bottom line is prayer, the box of prayer shouldn't be a mystery to believers. And by the way, you want to know what's in the box? Nothing. <laughs> the mystery of the prayer should not be a, a mystery box to a believer. A believer ought to understand prayer, and that's what we're going to talk about today. You know, if you know the mystery of what's in the box already, I could have opened that box with confidence because I taped it shut, and I knew exactly what was in it, an empty box. I knew it wasn't going to hurt me. But if you know prayer and you understand prayer and you're a believer, there should be no mystery to prayer either, and you ought to be able to open the box of prayer with confidence. You ought to be able to jump into your prayer life 
with confidence. To those of us who know Jesus Christ through the cross and the resurrection, there shouldn't be any mystery about prayer. And let me do, this is, this is a little bit of a difficult sermon for me because you've got to go a couple different ways when you talk about prayer. But let me say this first of all. To the believer, the true believer, that's accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, means it with all their heart, I want you to get something. He loves you, bottom line. He loves you. Doesn't mean the answers are always going to be yes. But he loves you. So as we approach the throne of God through the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross as our mediator, as we approach the throne of God, we approach the throne of God knowing one very, 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 very important thing. He loves us. So therefore we can trust his answers. He loves us and we can trust his answers. It's a privilege to approach God with the confidence that because the blood of Jesus Christ has washed away our sins, that we can approach God, and when we approach God, we are accepted just as we are because he can't look on sin, but he sees the blood of Jesus that washed away our sins. And so we have this privilege of talking to God about everything in our life. Some people think prayer is just really weird. You've got to know the King James English, just pray and all this Prayer is just like talking to anybody else. That's all it is. Just talk to God. Just talk to him. And you have that privilege. And by the way, as a born-again believer, it's a great privilege. Would you rather go to some priest to talk to God, or would you rather talk directly to God through Jesus Christ? We have that privilege. It's not a mystery, folks. It's a privilege. And Lord, I thank you for the privilege of prayer. Lord, what an awesome thing it is that in the midst of my valley, in the midst of my high, in the midst of whatever's going on in my life, Lord, that I have the opportunity to praise you, to seek you, to talk to you, to share with you, to share my heart with you. And Lord, when I have no words, I can simply whisper the name Jesus. And you know my heart. You know my heart. What a privilege prayer is. Thank you, Lord, for that privilege. First, we want to talk about requests made for others and for yourself. Requests made for others and for yourself. Does God answer prayer? The answer is yes. We have seen God answer amazing prayers in this place. We've seen us gather together on Sunday mornings, anoint people with oil, pray for them, and we've seen God do amazing things in some of those lives. But we've also seen some people we prayed for die. But God does answer prayer. And so how do you put those two things together? How, how do you figure that out? Remember, God loves you. Does prayer change things? Yes, I believe prayer opens up heaven. I believe prayer changes things. We have been emphasizing prayer in this church now for several years, and, and I believe prayer changes things. As we pray for a great awakening or the second coming or whatever God wants to do, I believe prayer opens those doors. I believe prayer changes things in an amazing way, and when we pray in his will with believing faith, I believe it changes things. But as we look at the Lord's Prayer, it says, give us this day our daily bread. It does not say, give me my daily bread. Give me this day my daily bread, does it? It says, give us this day our daily bread. What's the insinuation there? It's okay to pray for yourself, but we ought to be praying for others as well, right? Jesus set the example. He said, give us. He's praying for everybody. Everybody should be praying for others. Are you praying for others? Paul prayed for others. In verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 3, Paul writes, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named. For what reason? That he could be praying for others. We should follow Paul's example. We should be praying for others. In verse 16, I pray that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory. Paul asked boldly. And he just doesn't ask for meager things. He approaches the throne of God boldly, and he says, give to us, Lord. Give to others, Lord. Lord, give, them, give to them out of the riches of your glory. I mean, God is God. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Everything belongs to him. Sometimes I think we don't ask for enough. He says, Lord, grant them 
he prays that the Lord may grant you, speaking to those in, in Ephesus, that the Lord may grant you according to his riches of glory. God is all powerful. In fact, Paul says in verse 20, a little later, he says, now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask. When you pray to God and you ask for something, you need to understand, number one, he loves you, and number two, he is able. He is able. There is nothing too big for God. Remember that. He is able. He goes on, and he says, I pray that you'd be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Paul talks about the inner man first. Paul is pray, praying for them to be strengthened in the spirit of God. Paul is praying for their spiritual walk. We tend to spend a lot of time praying for people to be healed, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're going to pray for somebody to be healed, you ought to be praying for their inner person as well. You ought to be praying that they're healed spiritually as well. I remember a, a lady in India that came up to me, and she wanted me to, to, to pray for her because her legs hurt. If you've ever seen the way they squat in India when they sit, they don't sit in chairs. They just, I can't even do it, but they, they kind of sit down with their tail end almost on the ground, and that's how they sit. And I don't know how many people I had asked me to pray for them because their legs hurt, and I'm thinking, well, there's a reason your legs hurt. If I sat like that, my legs would hurt too. But anyway, she came and wanted me to pray for healing for her, which was common after the services. There was a lot of that. There would usually be a long line of people wanting to be prayed for. And I had preached the gospel message that day, and I said, have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And she said, no. And I said, well, I'll pray for you, but if you want real healing, it starts with Jesus. It starts with Jesus. So the inner man is important. The, the spiritual part of that is so very, very important. If we go on to verse 17, it says, and that Paul prays, and that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you being rooted and firmly grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and the width and the height and the depth of God's love. There's a whole sermon there. I'm not going there this morning. And to know the Messiah's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. As Paul prayed for the Ephesians, he prayed that they might be filled with the Spirit of God. They might be filled with all of the fullness of God and that they would know his great love. And healing would take place after that. You see, sometimes we jump right to the healing because, you know, physical issues are a big deal. They get your attention. If you've got some kind of a, a bad physical issue, it gets your attention all the time. And so we, we tend to jump right into that. But we really ought to be starting with what's inside. Are you a believer? Are you a true believer? Do you trust God with everything that you are? Have you given your heart to him? And do you continually trust him? And when we pray for physically, physical healing, we shouldn't forget to pray for that inner man, that inner woman, that what's going on inside is just as important as what's going on with the body as we pray for them. So, yes, we are commanded. Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. We're commanded to pray for others. We're commanded to pray for ourselves, many places in the Scripture. And so we should pray. Now, let, let's talk about God's answer for a minute. Let's talk about God's answer when you pray. As we pray, our faith should be based on the power of God, the promises of God and the Word of God, and His ability to deliver. As we pray, our faith, we should pray in faith. The Bible says that we pray in faith believing. As we pray in faith, our faith should not be based on us. It should be based on the power of God, the ability of God to deliver us, and the love of God. That's what it be on the promises of God. We've already discussed that God is able. And that's where the rub comes in. I know God is able. I'm praying with all of my heart. And I'm praying for a certain thing. And it doesn't happen. What does that mean? Were my prayers faulty? Was my faith faulty? What does that mean? 
We've already discussed that God is able, but what has God promised? Here's where the rub comes in. What has God promised? Many people today are losing faith because they're hearing false doctrine and believing that God has promised something he has not promised. Let me be very, very clear. God has not promised health and wealth in this life. That is a false theology straight from the devil. Because what happens? If I buy into that philosophy and I believe that God's going to make me rich and God's going to always make me healthy, and I buy into that philosophy, what happens when the doctor calls with bad news? What happens when I can't pay the bills? Oh, God must not have been as powerful as I thought he was. You see, that's a false theology. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you'll always be healthy and you'll always be wealthy. And there are charlatans out there preaching that Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, especially on TV, but in other churches as well. God did not promise you would be healthy. God did not promise you would be wealthy. What does God promise? What does God promise? He's promised eternal blessings to his children. That's what he's promised. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be healthy in this life, and it sure doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be wealthy in this life, no matter how many faith gifts you send to some evangelists thinking you're going to get rich. The bottom line is God has promised eternal blessings. Is there going to be trouble in this life? Yes, there is. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. There is going to be trouble in this life. And when that trouble comes, if you understand that your promise of God, you know, if you read the Bible as a whole, you can pick out one or two verses and make it say anything you want. But if you read the Bible as a whole and you understand that the promise of God is for eternal blessings, I can make it through whatever comes in this life because I know that the eternal blessings are on the way. And one day I'm going to enter heaven and there'll be no more sickness, there'll be no more tears, there'll be no more sadness, it'll all be over and God will promise those eternal blessings that I have coming. I can get through this life if I know what the next life is coming. And maybe it's selfish, but as I get older, I tend to find myself saying, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Come quickly. Now, for you young people who haven't lived your life yet, you may think that's a selfish prayer, but it's going to be great for all of us when it happens. And I believe it may be much closer than we think with what's going on today. But people lose their faith because they pray and they think they're praying in faith believing and they're almost commanding God to do something. And when he doesn't do it, they lose their faith. But the bottom line is, if you read what it says before, give us this day our daily bread, it says thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You see, everything that God grants has to fit into his plan. It has to fit into his will, his will, and sometimes it doesn't fit into his will when we pray. In fact, sometimes the best answer is no, because God knows what's ahead. The Bible is full of examples of his children suffering. You just read. I'll just give you a couple of them. Stephen, stoned to death for his faith in the early church. Paul had a thorn in the flesh that he prayed God would remove, but God never sought to remove it. Paul was stoned, left for dead, whipped, imprisoned, beaten, and yet he stayed faithful. Where's the health and wealth philosophy in that? There was much persecution in the early church. Paul was part of that. And all the apostles, with the exception of John, Every one of the apostles died a martyr's death for their faith. They died at the hands of the government for their faith or the leaders for their faith. Every one of them. The only one that didn't was John, and he died in prison on the island of Patmos. It wasn't like he was just, you know, doing whatever he wanted to do. He was in prison. There's where he got the vision of Revelation. But he died in prison. The rest of them died a martyr's death. How can we say that if we believe enough, we'll be okay? I remember a lady, her name was Barbara, First Baptist Church of Union. I went to visit with her, and every time I'd go visit with her, she was dying of liver cancer in the hospital. And every time I went to visit with her, I'd go, I'd I'd wonder, Lord, 
what am I, what am I going to say to this lady? How, how do I minister to her? And every time I went, I really didn't need to minister to her. She was ministering to me. She was so full of Jesus. And I remember a lady from another church came in and said, the only reason you're dying is because you don't have enough faith. If you'd have enough faith, you'd be okay. That's a lie straight out of hell. I mean, I want you to think about that for a minute. That's not true. Look at church history. Charles Spurgeon, the great pastor of the Metropolitan Church of London, who preached to thousands and thousands of people, suffered from gout and liver disease most of his life to the point that there were a lot of Sundays he couldn't even go to the pulpit. He was so sick and in so much pain in those days. Martin Luther, the author of the, Re of, of, of the Reformation, the one who said the church is corrupt and he tacked the theses on the door at Wittenberg and started uh, uh, the Christian Reformation, which we're, we didn't come directly out of the Reformation as Baptists, but, you know, kind of long distance we got there. Changed church history. Suffered from all kinds of diseases. He was very ill a lot of the time. Jonathan Edwards in the 18th century one of the authors of the Great Awakening, we've been praying for Great Awakening, and there's been several in the past, and he was the author of one of the Great Awakenings in the 18th century. He died of a smallpox vaccination. Just that simple. And let's be honest, every Christian that has become a Christian since Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, every one of them, except those of us who are still here right now, died. Even the, quote, faith healer, Catherine Kuhlman, died. Everybody dies. If you live long enough and the Lord doesn't come back, you will die too. Does that mean God doesn't love you? Because he didn't heal you of whatever it was at the time? We need to understand that physical healing, at the very best, is temporary. At the very best, it's temporary. Whether it's medical physical healing or spiritual physical healing, at the very best, it's temporary because we're all going to die if we live long enough and the Lord doesn't come back. And so we see these wrong understandings of faith that rob people of their faith because they've been told if you just believe enough and if you do this and you do this and you do this and you believe enough, God will heal you and he'll make you rich. And that's not the truth of the word of God at all. If that's the truth, then why did all these great men of the word of God have all of these problems? So we need to understand we're no different than they are. It's just a wrong understanding of faith. God's healing in your life, whether it's spiritual or physical, is not based on your faith. It's based on his will. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. John 5, 14, now this is the confidence we have before him. Whenever we ask anything, and here's the words, according to his will, he hears us. And, we, and if we know that he hears us whenever we ask, we know that what we, we have what we've asked him for. But the qualifier there is in his will. I don't hear people say this very much anymore, but when I was a kid, I was taught to pray, Lord, would you do this, would you do this, would you do this, would you do this, if it's your will. We don't say that much anymore, but it is. it has to be in his will. God has an ultimate plan. He has an ultimate will. He has a permissive will. There are things that we pray for that he can fit into his plan, and yeah, he gives us those wonderful gifts. There are things that we pray for that are just not in his will. God hears and answers our prayers, but his will and his love for us is primary. Because of his great love for us, when it fits into his will and his plan, you're going to get what you're praying for. Sometimes we pray outside of his will. Sometimes we're not walking in his will. We're not walking in his ways. We're not living it out in our lives. We're not in tune with the Spirit. And we pray, and we pray for things that are not good for us. I remember when we, uh, before we came here, we were long before we came here. I was the minister of music and youth at, at uh, Anna Heights Baptist Church in Anna, Illinois. Our pastor was elderly and had a lot of health problems, and I, pre I preached a lot during those five years we were there. And during that 
five-year period of time, God began to call me into the preaching ministry. I was already in ministry, but he called me into the preaching ministry. I remember about that time that Linwood Baptist Church in Cape was without a pastor. That was my home church. James Hastings was the head of the personnel committee looking for a pastor, the pastor search committee. I used to date his daughter, spend a lot of time in his house. So I wrote him a letter, sent him a resume, and I began to pray. Because I was in a church about the same size as Linwood at Anna Heights, and I began to pray, Lord, this has got to be it. Lord, make me the pastor at Linwood. Let him call me to be the pastor. And I prayed that prayer for a long time, in faith believing, God, this has got to be it. It's my home church. It's got to be the one. It would be a great place to start my first actual preaching pastorate. You know what? God didn't answer that prayer. He said no. And when he, what he did send me to, I thought, was the end of the world. He said no. Okay. So, Lord, what do you want? We were at a Carmen concert at the Show Me Center. I had my youth group there from Illinois. And Carmen was talking about how if, if you miss God's will for your life, you can get back on track right now by getting saved. That's what he was talking about. But God spoke to my heart while he was talking. He said, Mitch, I'm not really interested in what you want. I want you to seek what I want. And right there, next to my wife, with a youth group all around me, quietly during the invitation, I said, okay, Lord, I get it. Lord, I, I give it to you. I know you've called me to preach. I'm anxious to do it. I don't care where it's at, what size the church it is, what the salary is. doesn't matter. Just let me know it's you and I'll do it. Walked out of that concert, ran into a guy that I'd met a long time ago, and six months before that, he had asked me to send a resume to Ava Missionary Baptist Church because he'd been filling in there and they were looking for a pastor. And I looked it up. It was a tiny church. And I looked it up and said, no, that's not for me. I walked out of that concert after telling God I would do anything I, he wanted me to do. And there's that guy. Hi, Mitch, how are you doing? Well, how are you doing? He, you know what the first words out of his mouth were after that? Did you ever send that resume to Ava? I said, no, but I will tomorrow. And I did, and next thing you know, I was their pastor. And the things I offered God came true. A little bit of church, not much salary. In fact, I had to work outside of, the, outside of the church to make ends meet while we were there. But God knew what he was doing. It was a great place to serve. I learned a lot while I was there. And that's where you called me from 24 years ago, after I'd been there for five years. You see, God's answer is always best for us. And the, 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 to me, the supreme example of that is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26, 39? It says, going a little farther, he fell face down and he prayed. And what did he pray? My father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus was praying, Lord, help me not have to do this. I know what's ahead. Help me not to have to do this. But Lord, if it's your will, I'll do it anyway. But Lord, help me not to do this. And if God always gave us everything we wanted when we prayed in faith believing, I believe the master of faith, Jesus Christ himself, would have been released from the cross. But that's what he wanted. But he knew he couldn't have it. And he went to the cross and he died. And God's answer was, no, you have to stay within my will. And guess what? Because he did and rose from the dead, he made salvation for all of us. God's answer, no, in the garden turned into wonderful things for all of us who believe in him. And by the way, it worked for him too. He is the king of heaven now, sitting on the throne. We might not always understand God's answer. I'm sure Jesus understood, but I don't always understand God's answer. But I understand that God's plan is primary. I believe that God has a plan for each of our lives, and he knows what's ahead. And sometimes no is the best answer we can hear. In the long run, God's plan is best for us. Lord, we love you.
And we thank you for what Jesus did on the cross. And we thank you, Lord, that he was willing, because he was the perfect son of God, God himself in flesh, to follow your example and to grow to that cross and follow your will so that we might have salvation today. And thank you, Lord, so much for doing that. But help us, Lord, to understand that when we pray, the answer is not always yes. And help us to trust you, Lord, with the answer that you give. Let's look at the correct understanding of faith here, and I'm done. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Matthew says, keep asking and it will be given you. Keep searching and you'll find it. Keep knocking and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who searches finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. The correct understanding of faith is that verses like these need to be interpreted in view of all of God's word. And what we need to understand is The correct way to understand faith is that Jesus loves us. He loves you. He loves me. He wants the very best for us. And yes, he heals many prayers for healing. I mean, answers many prayers for healing. We've seen it. And he answers other prayers for all kinds of needs. We're commanded to pray. And I believe with all my heart that prayer changes things. But sometimes the answer is not the one. We wanted to hear. Verse 9, for what man among you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Good fathers are to be trusted, aren't they? I don't know if you had a good father or not, but I did. A good father loves his children. He wants the very best for them. If you're a good father or dad today, you want the very best for your children. Verse 10, or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a snake? Now, bread and fish is what they ate, and basically a good father's responsibility ought to be to feed his children. A good father takes care of the earthly needs of his children. If you can't tell by looking, I was well-fed as a child. Now, there was a time when I wasn't so well-fed when my mom said at 10 years old, you're too fat, we're going to cut you back. (laughs) I'm glad she did, because I didn't get fat again until after I finished playing football. But my good father that loved me and fed me and took care of me and provided everything I needed didn't give me everything I asked for. When I turned 16, I wanted a motorcycle. My mom and my dad both said, nope, not going to happen. But I got the money. I'm working. I'll pay for it. Nope, not going to happen. I guess the reason is they've seen me drive a car already and figured a motorcycle would be worse. But the bottom line, it wasn't my mom and dad's will to let me have a motorcycle. Now, I got my motorcycle, but not till I got married. But it wasn't their will to let me have a motorcycle at 16 years old. They didn't believe it was the best for me. And probably knowing what I know now, it probably wouldn't have been the best for me at 16 years old because I was a pretty wild driver in a car. I I reached a point where if I got one more ticket, I was going to lose my license. And by then, I was dating Cindy. And I gave her permission, because she always sat right next to me. We had a bench seat in the car, and she sat right next to me. And I gave her permission to watch the speedometer and tell me if I got over the speed limit. The problem is, I took that permission back a long time ago, but she doesn't remember that part. They wanted the best for me because I had a good mom and a good dad. Verse 11 says in, in, in Matthew there, if, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? It really boils down to this when we pray. Here's the mystery of the box of prayer. We need to trust the Lord that he has our best interest at heart. We need to love the Lord so much that we know in the long run, whatever he answers, whether the answer is yes, no, or wait, whatever the answer is, that we love him and we can trust his answer. And I don't know about you, but I can look back on my life. There's many times I prayed for something and God said no, and looking back, I know it was the right answer. It was the right answer. There are many promises, great promises in the Word of God. I've got a whole list of them that I pray through occasionally as I pray for my wife. And we can believe in them. And we can count on them. The Bible says the Lord is a strong tower. 
and he that runs into it will find shelter. I trust that with all my heart. But just remember that everything we pray for is filtered through God's great love for us and filtered through his ultimate will for us and his plan for us. His will is always for the best, even when we don't understand it now. That's hard, but we need to understand that his will is always best. I believe in prayer. You know I do. I preach it. I teach it. We do it. I believe prayer changes things in a great way. But I also believe there are times we need to understand that the answer may be no or not right now. And that shouldn't cause us to lose faith, and it shouldn't cause us not to trust God. In fact, it ought to cause us to trust him more, that, Lord, we believe it's all there. We believe you've got it all under control. And, Lord, we may not be able to see your hand right now in what's going on in our lives, but as the old song says, we trust your heart. We trust your heart. When you can't see his hand at work in your life, trust that he loves you. Trust his heart. He'll always be about our best. He wants the very best for each one of us. Jeremiah 29, starting in the 11th verse, says this, For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your welfare. Not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. And that's exactly what God has given us. He has given us a future and a hope. Things may look grim at times. We may wonder why we're going through what we're going through. We may wonder why a loved one that died. But let me help you to understand, I've said this to many families, when a believer in Jesus, a true believer, one that has the marks of a believer, dies. When that person dies, the future and the hope has just begun, and the suffering is over. We all want to go to heaven, right? Just not today. Isn't that right? We all want to go to heaven, just not today. But when the time comes, and it is your time, and it's appointed a man wants to die, and then the judgment, when that time comes, it's a reward. It's not a punishment. Or the believer. Lord, help us to be so full of your spirit and so trusting of you and so understanding of your great love for us that sent you to the die on the cross, even after you prayed in the garden, Lord, let this cup pass from me, if it be your will. And it wasn't. Lord, help us to have such great love for you and such understanding of how your great love for us. So no matter what life throws us, no matter uh, what kind of rain falls on us, no matter how difficult it may be, no matter what we go through, Lord, that we know that you are with us. Lord, you're not only with us on the mountaintop, you're with us in the valley. And you've never promised to make the valley go away, but Lord, you've promised to walk through it with us. You've tra- promised, Lord, to be there with us, never forsaking us. never leaving us, always there for us. Thank you so much for that, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I pray today, if there's somebody here that's never become a true believer, that they'd understand they're missing the greatest joy in life. Even in the valley, there's joy when you have Jesus. On the mountaintop, there's joy when you have Jesus. On the way up and on the way down, There is joy in our hearts when we have Jesus because we know he's given us a hope and a future. Oh, Lord, speak to hearts today. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Let's stand for our time of invitation. If God's spoken to your heart today, the altar is open. You may need to come and pray. If you want to speak to one of the pastors about salvation or any other issue that you'd like to be prayed with, We'd be glad to pray with you today. So you come as we sing.
Here's what I'd like for you to do today. We didn't have our normal prayer time earlier in the service, but I'd like for you to take this time right now because in just a moment, we're going to celebrate the ordinances of the church, baptism and then the Lord's Supper. So as we prepare for the Lord's Supper, I would ask you to take this moment while they're singing or playing or whatever they're going to do, to bow your heads, confess your sins before God, and get ready to get clean to take the Lord's Supper. Every time we take the Lord's Supper, it ought to be a time of starting over with Jesus Christ, a time of seeking his will, a time of prayer, a time of saying to him, Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven in my own life. So take a moment, bow your heads, do business with God while they continue. seated. Deacons are here. At this time, uh, we're going to have baptism, and then we're going to take the offering at the very end, okay, guys? We're going to take the offering at the very end while we sing the hymn at the end. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, um, Ben Thatcher. He's going to uh, have the privilege to baptize his niece. Thank you. Libby Gray, would you like to tell us what's taken place in your life? Jesus. Jesus? Yes, he has. You decided to accept him into your life? Yes. So do you confess before everyone here today that You've uh, accepted God's invitation to become his child and to receive Jesus as the Lord of your life? Yes. Okay. And do you believe that by his death and resurrection, you've been given the forgiveness of sins and that you'll have eternal life with him? Yes. Okay. It's my honor as your uncle and brother in Christ to baptize you in the name of the Father, his Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let me remind you that next Sunday, revival starts with Ken Freeman. Uh, he'll be here all week. We will not have services on Friday and Saturday night, but we'll have services the rest of the week and both Sundays. And two weeks from today, we have, we're going to have a massive, hopefully massive baptism service. We already have several lined up for that. And so um, be praying about that. <clears throat> Make sure you're here next Sunday morning and get in on the very beginning. Because it is going to be a great week. If you remember, we had a lot of people saved the last time he was here. It was a great week, and we're really looking forward to Ken being with us again.
It'll be his third time being with us, so we're excited about that. So at this point, we're going to move into the Lord's Supper, and um, guys, if you'll come and uncover the elements, we'll get started. looking for the bread. A word of instruction, all right, before you get it. There's a little film on top. You peel off the bread's under that. Then you peel off the rest of it, and the juice is under that, all right? And so when you get it, we will do it one at a time, just like we normally do. Uh, but these, that way, they don't have to handle it but once. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Guys, let's pass it out. Then we'll have the two prayers and the two.
Jared, would you lead us in prayer for the bread? Jesus said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for the forgiveness of sins. AC, would you lead us in prayer for the juice? The Lord said, Jesus, the Lord Jesus said, this is the blood of the new covenant, which is given for the forgiveness of sins. This time I'm going to ask the ushers to come. We'll receive the offering. And then as the uh, word says, that when they'd finished and left, the upper room, they sang a hymn and went out. So ushers, if you'll come, and we'll receive the offering. And then we're going to sing a verse of Amazing Grace and you'll be dismissed. Turn the volume up on Ken Freeman. If you can, start it over. Uh, I'm going to get in his... Can you run it back? Minor Baptist Church, Ken Freeman. Coming to a church not near you, but it is you. October 10th through the 17th, a Sunday to a Sunday. Very few churches would ever do this. Uh, I'm going to get in as many schools as Dave can get me in. I'm, would you be praying with me for that? I'm going to invite as many people. I'm going to do FCAs, whatever it takes. But this is a time of harvest this week. Uh, I believe more people are, are, are hungry for truth. They're looking for hope, help, healing, all of that. And so my prayer is that you right now would begin to write down people's names, maybe put them at the altar of your church after you see this. Go up during the invitation and put all those names out. I was at a church in Big Springs, Texas. We had over 60 people come to Christ, and many of those, their names were written down month, months in advance, and they brought them. So I'm going to encourage you, don't come by yourself Sunday morning when I'm there on the 10th or any of the nights. I pray that you'll bring somebody, co-workers, neighbors, teammates, classmates, friends, even bring some enemies. I don't care. But my prayer is is that your church would be filled. Let's don't let this COVID steal any more from us. There are people that are lost and going to hell and they're running out of time. So let's be the watch keepers. I mean, let's, let's be watchful for what God's gonna do, but more than anything, let's get people to your church October 10th through the 17th. It's the great comeback. We're gonna come back from this virus in many ways and I challenge you Get people there. Again, write their names down on a piece of paper. Right now as I'm speaking, as they show this video, write their names down, families down, bosses, coworkers, neighbors, friends, teammates. And I'm praying for students to get their teams there, the band there, whatever they're a part of. But I'm praying for a great harvest. The harvest is now. The harvest is now. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says today is the day of salvation. Hey, I'm going to do my part. You do your part. Let's get people there. Man, I'm praying for you. Thank you for being in my life. Thank you for being a blessing to me. And I pray that God will give the biggest harvest 
that this church has ever seen, and uh, and I'm believing that. Hey, man, pray for me. I need the prayers. You need the practice, and uh, love you guys. See you in about a week. Bye. Amen. You don't want to miss that. Bring somebody with you. Let's stand, and we're going to sing a hymn and be dismissed.